China's Influence Abroad. In a publication by Roberto S. Foa et al., A World Divided, Russia, China, and the West, there's a very interesting finding on the gradual polarization of world public opinion in 2022. They basically observe that the world is polarizing in their opinion between two camps, the U.S. on the one hand and Russia and China on the other. In the side that is favorable to the U.S., you've got about 1.2 billion people with economies of around 70 trillion in mostly the developed world. They have a 75% negative view of China and an 87% negative view of Russia. In the Chinese-Russian camp are around 4.6 billion people in the developing world, and these are about 62% favorable to China versus 61% favorable to the U.S. Now this is a, a very small marginal difference, but it's about the trend, and the trend is moving in the direction of favoring China. 69% of pro-Russian and 73% of pro-Chinese sentiment comes from developing countries that are disillusioned with the corruption of their democracies. Now, the conclusion of the authors is that it's the failure of democracy to deliver that has created this support for the Chinese and Russian economic models. I don't agree with that conclusion. I certainly think there's a correlation. I think the causal link is that authoritarian regimes tend to manufacture animosity since many of the developing countries were at one point colonized they're essentially anti-western because they recognize that china is a non-western country and is improving their economic situation they perhaps have the feeling that they don't need to rely on western countries who they may be envious of or easily made hostile against and Russia is seen as a counter to the West traditionally, particularly in its role in communism during the Cold War. So this is one of their charts, Global Attitudes Towards China, that comes from the Cambridge Report. And you can see in the lighter colors the support for China and Russia. And you can see it in countries like Pakistan, some of the countries in Central Asia, and a great many countries in the Middle East and Africa. In a comparison of the U.S. versus China, you can see basically the same representation. The Russians are most supportive of China, along with Laos, Iran, Pakistan, Tanzania, Bolivia, Mexico, Serbia, and the rest of the world is essentially divided or supportive of the U.S. Now, one of the surprising findings is that during the Cold War, and traditionally, even before the Cold War, Latin American countries were anti-American because of the overwhelming influence the U.S. exerted, as well as the intervention in politics that the U.S. conducted in Central America and the Caribbean. However, because Latin America is liberalizing, surprisingly, it's moving in the opposite direction from the developing world. So Latin America is increasing its support for the U.S., decreasing its support for Russia and China, even as other parts of the world, like the Middle East and Africa, are increasing their support for China and Russia. In an article in the Hill Times, I argued with a co-author that Canada was neglecting its relatively large influence based on its economy by not cooperating with the U.S. in enabling the goals of Latin American states that would solidify them even further in the coalition of the democracies. We have war and the threat of war caused by authoritarian states like Russia and China, and Latin America is a very important supplier of raw materials as well as an increasingly industrial part of the world that needs to be a, uh, contribute along with the U.S. to govern North and South America collectively. It's no longer the situation like it was in the past where South American countries were not wealthy. Uh, 
the uh, Brazil has a very large economy. And so it matters now that Canada become more involved. This is a representation of the shifting opinions of Russia over time. And it was a fairly even distribution 10 years ago in 2012. But with Russia's actions in Ukraine, you can see it's pushed the split. And so we're likely to see the same kind of polarization if China were to attack Taiwan. You've got the developed world moving to the extreme left where there is significant disapproval of Russia and authoritarian regimes largely clustering along with emerging democracies in the right. Now many of these emerging democracies are of course in Africa and the Middle East and they're unstable and again as I argued earlier it's very likely there's manufactured animosity. Now I made an observation in an article for the Hill Times that the West has not been putting enough focus on the military consequences of the coalition that China is collecting around itself, which would be the requirement for it to conduct war. You can see in the top map the emergence of the Central Powers in brown. And they had some countries that were effectively on the fence. Although it shows that Afghanistan, for example, was an ally of the West, many of these countries were in effect bandwagoning. They weren't strong enough to resist, but had the Central Powers won, many of them would have declared against the European colonial powers. In the picture below, you could see the situation as it was in 1942 after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. What's not shown are other countries that did in fact join the, the Axis powers like Iraq, which had a coup. So there, there were countries like uh, Iran and Afghanistan which were sympathetic to the Germans as a counterbalance to the Russians and the English in the region. So both of these maps underrepresent the potential source of allies. The Soviet Union, of course, had a much greater success during the Cold War by leveraging the influence of communism to get allies in the developing world from Asia to the Middle East to Africa to South America. Democracies tend to have a pathology of being unprepared because of the cost of military preparations as well as the ideological perception that protection of a country even if that country has liberal values is not what citizens will vote for. At the top you can see Swift who encouraged the English government through his pamphleteering to support Walpole to essentially sideline the uh, Duke of Marlborough who was fighting Louis XIV in Europe. And it was a form of domestic politics taking precedence over a major national security threat in the form of Louis XIV's France. Below that you can see Addington who is the uh, young individual on the left who created an appeasement government after the Second Coalition and made peace with Napoleon. Now some argue that it allowed England in order to get the time to prepare for war, but in reality it gave Napoleon room to breathe when England should have been at war. On the right you see Pitt the Younger who was ideologically opposed to tyranny because he believed that countries that were authoritarian would end up creating leaders that would seek glory through war, like Napoleon. In the bottom picture you can see Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister. His father owned a screw concern and at one point in the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, he sold 40% of all the screws sold in the world. Clearly someone interested in business and not diplomacy. And this is one of the dysfunctions of democracy, which is you need money to win elections, 
that money comes from business people, so their interests receive privilege. And of course, business people like peace. The problem is they like peace at any cost. Because once war begins, commerce comes to an abrupt halt. And so Neville Chamberlain, but not only Neville Chamberlain, many people in British society and government were desperate to achieve peace at any cost with the fascists that were emerging in the 1930s. In the Hill Times article on the left, I examined the success of AUKUS. That's an organization that includes Australia, the UK, and the US, while they're making preparations for war against a possible Chinese attack on Taiwan. And I compared it to Canada, which did not contribute to deterrence in the Pacific. And in a second article that you can see on the right, I criticized those countries that were only deploying ships. Because ships are easily deployed, but also easily removed. And it's similar to Canada's token deployment of two battalions of soldiers to Hong Kong a few months before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor as a rather weak attempt to deter the Japanese from starting war. Not only were the troops in very small numbers, there were only two battalions of less than 2,000 soldiers, but they had not yet been trained. And so when the Japanese attacked them, they were overrun uh, within a week. So you can see here the regional changing perceptions of China between 2012 and 2022. And you can see in particular the former Soviet states, the sub-Saharan states, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and South Asia all supporting China, in large part because it's seen as a counterbalance to the Western democracies. Only primarily in the Pacific North Asian region, countries including Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, and the Anglo-Saxon democracies and the European Union, and Latin America, do you see a reverse trend. So if there was a conflict over Taiwan, the world would be split. Now, it's not necessarily true that a government is going to follow the sentiments of its population because a great many developing countries depend on trade with the wealthy established democracies. But the population, in effect, might be reacting to past perceived injustices, which could have strategic effects. They may deny basing to uh, Western states or allow China to conduct intelligence gathering operations on their territory. One could imagine a country like the Republic of South Africa siding with China in a war and then making it difficult for Western shipping bringing oil from the Persian Gulf or ships going into the Indian Ocean to the Strait of Malacca not being threatened or harassed by uh, Chinese supporters within the Republic of South Africa. Historically, European powers, when they were engaged in war, would secure the control of the Cape. And this might again be an issue if there's a conflict with China over Taiwan. I made an observation that given a number of factors, China's actually got a closing window of opportunity on Taiwan. And a part of it, of course, are the domestic issues in China itself, which are demographic weakness, uh, climate change induced ecological costs, the uh, essentially the shrinking of the population and the already shrinking labor force vis-a-vis -vis other challenges China's got to deal with uh, as, as well as the push for liberalization in the population that is inevitably going to occur. So China's search for allies is occurring simultaneously with this. As democracy spreads, those countries are very likely not to be Chinese allies. And so China's got an incentive to cement its allies and to be regressive with regard to the uh, spread of democracy. So ultimately we could end up with a division of the world on the elite.
allegiance of pro-authoritarian versus pro-democratic. And so you can see the, the countries on either side. And you can also see the neutral countries in the middle, who are not likely to be a majority of the world's population, but would nevertheless be a significant double-digit percentage. So you can see countries largely from Africa and the Middle East that are deployed in that zone. So let us take a look at the different regions and their associations with China. China's relationship with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is an important one for three reasons. One, ASEAN sits, sits astride China's main maritime trade routes. 80% of China's imported oil goes through there. Two, they are substantial trading partners. And three, many have good relations with the U.S. and may be recruited to participate in the containment of China. They are engaged in a form of soft balancing termed hedging, where they engage both China and the U.S. simultaneously. ASEAN itself is a weak or endogenous regime. In other words, it doesn't have an independent secretary that simply represents the views of its members. ASEAN has actually multiple adversaries among its members. Singapore and Malaysia uh, were antagonists after 1965, including Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, Myanmar. An ASEAN-China free trade area came into effect in 2010, but it didn't have a significant amount of effect because most of these countries are exporters and they don't trade between each other on the same scale as they do with distant customers. This is a map of the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, which the U.S. tried to organize along the same lines as CENTO, the Central Treaty Organization. It included Thailand and the Philippines, but ultimately became uh, defunct. This is a comparison of the different countries in the region. The key point is that the total population of Southeast Asia is significant. It's almost half of China's population. It would make it very difficult for China to bully its way into the Indian Ocean. Uh, probably on their own, just because of all the islands and the large scale of populations, there's a significant deterrent element here that is almost insurmountable for China. So there's a couple observations besides the large population, which is they do generally have small militaries. But the small militaries, with the exception of countries like uh, Vietnam, which are right on the Chinese border, are deployed on islands and deployed on isthmus, which would make it difficult for China to conquer despite their size. And third, they have important strategic locations. Indonesia is generally suspicious of the emergence of China because of China's role in supporting the Chinese and communists in Indonesia leading up to the 1965 attempted communist coup, which led to a severing of relations in 1967. Indonesia has historically been more favorable to trade with Japan. Indonesia takes trades heavily with China, but the scale of cheap imports is leading to pressures for protectionism. 50% of the global merchant shipping passes through the Straits of Malacca, Sunda, and Lombok, mostly oil and liquid natural gas. Indonesia's gas fields around Natuna Island in the South China Sea are close to Chinese interests, and there have been a number of boundary disputes as well as issues with Chinese fishing vessels. You can see here the Indonesian AMX-13 and some Russian aircraft that they had purchased. This is the Indonesian archipelago, which is significant. Almost half the population lives on the island of Java, where the current capital of Jakarta is located. And you can see the, the, the various straits indicated in light blue. In the center of the map is Natuna Island. And there is an overlap between the exclusive economic zone claimed by Indonesia and the nine-dashed line claimed by China. Even though Natuna Island is not within that nine-dashed line, it impinges on Indonesia's exclusive economic zone. 
The Philippines is a traditional U.S. ally, which occupied it from 1899 until 1940. Subic Bay and Clark Field were U.S. bases during the Cold War and were evacuated in 1993 after the collapse of the Soviet Union. There is currently significant interest in the U.S. reestablishing bases because it's strategically located overseeing Chinese islands in the South China Sea, as well as providing significant air base and port facilities that could access Taiwan much more closely than either Japan or the islands of Okinawa or Guam. In the national interest, I wrote an article about how the U.S. could not win a war over Taiwan without having bases in the Philippines. The small islands of Okinawa and Guam are either very far away from Taiwan or because they're islands, there's not a lot of space to disperse their air units. And so the air bases and the ports on those islands would be very early on in a conflict destroyed by long range missiles and air attacks. Now there are a lot of basing facilities in Kyushu, Japan, which is the island of Japan closest to China, but it's three times as far as the Philippines. The U.S. cannot use its expensive aircraft carriers because of attrition. They will all eventually be destroyed by Chinese DF-21D missiles or submarines or Chinese air attacks. Aircraft carriers can never compete against the cheapness of a land base and the land-based aircraft. They're useful for fighting and winning in the open sea, but cannot survive against a the coast of a peer competitor. So the U.S. needs these bases. The problem is that, ta that Taiwan um, uh, could be circumvented, meaning the Chinese could seize Luzon, which is the northernmost island of the Philippines, and thereby cut off any opportunity for the U.S. Navy to resupply Taiwan. In effect, the Chinese operating out of Luzon could cut off the uh, supply routes to Taiwan. Now it's very politically uh, complex. The previous president of the Philippines was uh, Duterte. The uh, current president is the son of, of Marcos, who's a dictator in the 70s and 80s. And that individual, while being a dictator and an ally of the US, was personally hostile because his father was a Japanese collaborator and American-backed guerrillas assassinated his father. And when he fell from power in a people's uprising, the U.S. made a court decision against the estate of the senior Marcos, which the junior Marcos is now carrying. Now, you see here the American Secretary of Defense, Austin, shaking hands with the Philippines leader, Marcos. Uh, his vice president is Duterte's daughter. And so you have a regime that has a history of being anti-American. What's holding Taiwan in tow is that the majority of the population sees no other solution except allying with the U.S. in order to preserve the Philippines' uh, sovereignty over islands like the Scarborough Shoal, uh, which was seized by China. Now, it's very likely if there was a conflict over Taiwan, China might see a way of accelerating the, the end to that conflict by simply seizing Luzon. Here we have the deployment of the Japanese invasion forces in 1941 and 1942. And what is, what is generally indicated is that most of the landings would occur in Lengayen Gulf to the north or just across from the Bashi Channel. You can see on the top the invading Japanese in 1941 and 42 of the Philippines, and below you can see the contemporary Japanese Marines who have engaged in military exercises in the Philippines. What this means is the U.S. is facing a dilemma. They're not being provided permanent bases in the Philippines. They're probably um, uh, investigating the uh, use of bases on, on a limited uh, level, but the U.S. may have to counter-invade the Philippines if China tries to seize those facilities. There was a similar dilemma during the Second World War. 
the Germans, to avoid being hemmed in like they were in the First World War, their navy, they seized Norway in a surprise attack, and then the British counter-invaded, but were defeated. And the German seizure of Norway was strategically very important because it allowed the German Navy, including its submarines, to enter the North Sea and more easily cut off the British from supplies from North America, as well as blockading supplies from England to the Soviet Union, who were then fighting the Germans. So the Philippines has very much the same function. So China could, in a coup de grace, seize control of key parts of the Philippines. Now, one of the key problems for the U.S. is the Filipino military is exceptionally weak. There are only two divisions that are located in the middle or north of Luzon. The entire Filipino military only has seven light tanks, which are the scorpions that you see on the bottom left. They've got several hundred M113 armored personnel carriers but they have no armaments to defeat an armored tank or even another armored vehicle. They've got small trainer-like fighter aircraft, one squadron's worth, that's 12 to 15 aircraft, and the entire Philippines Navy only has two frigates. So it would take a very small Chinese force to capture Luzon, and then make use of its bases against uh, Taiwan's uh, defenses and the U.S. Navy trying to resupply it. Thailand. Historically a tributary state of the Ming Dynasty and sufficiently cohesive to withstand the arrival of the Europeans, Thailand has no particular disposition toward bandwagoning with regard to the rise of China. Its hostility to Vietnam led to good relations with the U.S., which continue, supplemented by good relations with China, uh, uh, to which it's a large rice exporter. Now, Thailand is concerned about local Chinese involvement in its sphere of influence, specifically Cambodia and Myanmar. Thailand possessed a light aircraft carrier in the 1990s and is gradually decommissioning it. Malaysia. While historically a protector of the Ming Dynasty against Thailand and Majapahit, which is archaic monarchy of Indonesia, Malaysia is less friendly with China due to Islamic Chinese social cleavages within its territory. The Chinese used to be 25% of their population and now 15% of Malaysia is Chinese, as well as Malaysian mistrust of Singapore, which is about 75% Chinese. Vietnam is committed to remaining independent from China. It was occupied for four different periods by China. Between 111 to 40 BC by the Qin Han Dynasty, from 43 to 554 by the Liang Dynasty, from 602 to 938 by the Sui Tang Dynasty, and from 1407 to 1427 during the Ming Dynasty. You can see on the left the original location of the state of Nam Viet. Vietnam actually pushed south over other kingdoms, including the Muslim kingdom of Kampa, uh, that was only finally defeated in the 1830s. So the Vietnamese people come from the region around Hunan province in central China and have been under pressure to move south uh, over the last 2,000 years. China aided Vietnam in its war against French occupation between 1949 and 1954 and against the U.S. supported Southern Vietnamese regime from 1954 to 1975. China deployed 170,000 soldiers mostly in air defense and logistics in North Vietnam. Once South Vietnam was occupied in 1975, Vietnam drifted towards an alliance with the Soviet Union to offset Chinese influence. North Vietnam then invaded Cambodia in 1978 and put pressure on the Bien Hoa Chinese, causing a lot of Chinese boat people to flee Vietnam. This led China to invade Vietnam for two weeks in 1979. Chinese performance against a combat experienced Vietnamese army led the attack to stall and domestic leaders in China were alerted to the need to rebuild the People's Liberation Army. 
border conflicts persisted into the 1980s. In 1990, Vietnam withdrew from Cambodia. Vietnam has since normalized relations with China and has become a large rice exporter to the Chinese, but remains wary of its influence and its intentions. This is the approximate area that China was able to occupy in its invasion of Vietnam before its attack bogged down, largely uh, because of the defense of territorial troops in those areas. Here you can see the origin of rice imports uh, to China from Southeast Asia. Now, Camran Bay was a naval base of interest to the U.S. as well as the Soviet Navy during the Cold War. And there is some speculation that the U.S. is interested in, in obtaining access to the base in the event of a conflict against China. Now, Cambodia. China supported the Khmer Rouge seizure of Cambodia in 1975, but opposed the Vietnamese counter-invasion in 1979. There is some popular resentment of China by Cambodians for its support of the Khmer Rouge and their genocide. But China is recognized as a valuable counterbalance to Thailand and Vietnam. Laos. Laos has better relations with Vietnam than China, but is concerned about Chinese power. During the 1979 invasion of Vietnam by China, it sided with Hanoi, and China retaliated in the 1980s by training Hmong insurgents in Yunnan province. So the South China Sea. The South China Seas, comprising the Chinese Vietnamese Paracel or Zisha Islands, and the Spratly Islands is disputed between China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and the Philippines. Its strategic values primarily that it is astride the strategic shipping lanes to Northeast Asia, plus some speculation that fossil fuels may be available there. These islands were wholly unpopulated, except as temporary sites by fishermen. Today, Taiwan has a 3,700-foot airfield and freshwater source on the island of Taiping Dao, or Ituaba, and China and Vietnam have been building assorted facilities on the atoll. In 1954, China claimed the South China Sea as sovereign territory in violation of the 1982 United Nations Law of the Sea, and has prominently displayed the claim in its passports. North Vietnam conceded the Paracel Zisha Islands to China in 1958, but announced the claim after the fall of Saigon in 1975. In 1974, China had seized the Zisha Islands from the South Vietnamese Navy. The renewed focus on the South China Sea emerged in 1995 when China built a permanent facility on Mischief Reef. There have been periodic naval clashes. In 2011-2012, China and Vietnam passed laws making competing claims on the Paracel and the Spratly Islands. In 2012, the China, Chinese Coast Guard vessels excluded Filipino fishing vessels during a dispute over the Scarborough Shoal. Now, the U.S. is reluctant to become involved in the dispute except to make demonstrations of the freedom of navigation. In 2013 to 2015, China deployed its very large-scale manufacturing capability and construction industry and turned a number of the shoals in the Spratly Islands into bases with extensive airfield and port facilities. In 2022, these islands were militarized and there was an air base that became ready for use by the Chinese Air Force as early as 2017. It can be appreciated that the South China Sea matters to a great many countries other than China. Japan's imports and exports travel on ships that pass through the Spratly Islands. These are the Zisha or the Paracel Islands that were originally controlled by Vietnam, but were seized by the Chinese in 1974. This is Sancha City on the Paracel Islands, 
which has been built up by the Chinese. This is a depiction of what Sancha Island could become following further Chinese investment. These are the Spratly Islands in the southern part of the South China Sea and it shows the different possessions of the islands and it's quite intermeshed. This is Mischief Reef which was the first base built by the Chinese. This is Taiwan's island, the Taiping Dao or Itu Aba Island. It's the only island with its own fresh water source. This was used as a submarine base by the Japanese during the Second World War. The Taiwanese, to reduce tensions, removed their military and deployed Coast Guard personnel to administer the island. You can see here the competing claims between the different countries on the littoral, particularly the overlapping of the exclusive economic zones and the fact that there are oil and gas fields, at least on the periphery of the South China Sea, that China's nine dashed line, which is what China's claim is, would impinge upon. Here you can see Soviet style bombers, Tupolev 22Ms and Tupolev 95 Bears, if China had those type of air units or equivalents and their bases in the Southeast Asian littoral and what reach they would have. And so this is meant to illustrate how these islands are useful for China to extend its reach with long range bombers. So this is the Strait of Malacca, which is causing so much stress and insecurity for China. The channel is very narrow because it is on a continental shelf and there's many islands and a lot of local shipping. And so it shows how narrow and easily blocked this channel is even by an anti-ship missile. The Middle East. Europe and by extension the US have a strong economic interest in Persian Gulf oil. Recognizing China's relatively lower level of influence in the Middle East, China has generally chosen to work with rather than against the great powers. For example, China avoided taking sides in the Arab-Israeli dispute, although it did recognize Israel in 1992, and cooperated with the U.S. in cutting off nuclear and missile-related trade to Iran. China's interests in the Middle East in the 1980s was in the commercial export of weapons in exchange for funds. This was made possible by the 1979 Iranian Revolution. China established relations with the United Arab Emirates in 1984, Qatar in 1988, Bahrain in 1989, and Saudi Arabia in 1990. China had already established relations with Kuwait in 1971. Here you can see the Persian Gulf and the different countries that have competing interests in many ways that China needs to navigate if it's to securely import oil from the Persian Gulf. Now China's early delegations were almost entirely Muslim Chinese. They were Hui or Muslim Han, with the added benefits that Arabs did not blame China for the fragmentation of the Caliphate, although perhaps the uh, Battle of Talash in Central Asia is no longer a memory. By 1993, China had become an importer of oil and its interests shifted to reliable imports. China's preferred method of obtaining oil is bilateral agreements as it believes that the open oil market is dominated by Western states and therefore can be blocked. Oman's oil was the first to be exported with the added advantage that it did not have to pass through the Straits of Hormuz. China is compelled by the domination of the main oil fields by Western companies to invest in riskier and less well-established regions for oil, such as Southern Sudan, Nigeria, Angola, Iran, and Venezuela. Saudi Arabia is a pivotal U.S. ally and helps maintain the steady flow and stability of oil prices, and the U.S. reciprocates with a security guarantee begun with the family of Ibn Saud in the 1920s. Saudi-China's 
Cooperation Agreement, the 1999 Strategic Oil Cooperation Agreement, led to significant investments, including a Saudi-built refinery in southern China. On Abdullah's accession to King in 2006, his first visit was to China. There are approximately 20,000 Chinese infrastructure workers in the kingdom. Nevertheless, there are tensions. Saudi Arabia plays off between the U.S. and Chinese interests. China recognizes that Saudi Arabia is also a major oil provider to some of China's adversaries, including Japan, India, and Taiwan. China is attempting to balance its relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia, which are adversaries, as it imports from both. Iran and Iraq China had close relations with Iran and Iraq during the Iran Iraq War, providing both sides combat aircraft, armored fighting vehicles, and ballistic missiles. U.S. pressure in the 1990s cut off proliferation aid to Iran, but China still maintains heavy trade. Since the U.S. invasion of Iraq, China has been well received counterbalance to the U.S., and Baghdad has offered China the Adab oil fields for a bid in 2007, although it didn't actually um, uh, go to China. In 2022, China signed a 25-year cooperation agreement with Iran, and the purpose was to cement relations, and Iran was eager to associate with China since it had been heavily sanctioned by the United States. However, during Xi Jinping's visit to Saudi Arabia in December of 2022, a number of statements made by Chinese officials were seen as provocative by Tehran, particularly because they sided with Saudi Arabia's interpretation of their sphere of influence. Iran and Saudi Arabia are, of course, caught in a rivalry in the Arabian Peninsula and in the Near East, with their different backed sides involved in fights over control of neighboring countries that matter to both. I wrote an article in Real Clear Defense with a co-author of mine from Iran trying to explain why Iran was eager to deal with China. It should be put in perspective that the animosity between uh, Iran and the U.S. is actually uh, much older. Although the U.S. interaction with Iran is quite recent and goes back to the 1920s and substantially really in the 1950s, the Iranians have been dealing with European encroachments for 500 years, beginning with the Portuguese who occupied the mouth of the Persian Gulf and by seizing an island and establishing a base and then demanding a toll from passing vessels. After the Portuguese came the Dutch and then the English. So Iran's foreign policy dealing with the West has been a fairly consistent attempt to find allies that can counterbalance the maritime influence of these uh, European powers, including uh, the U.S. Now there is a game being played here where China is coming into the Middle East as the world's largest oil importer and therefore having a significant amount of influence and having to navigate between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And this is an opportunity for the West to peel Iran away in the same way that one would want Russia peeled away from China. Fighting a war with China over Taiwan while Iran and Russia remain Chinese allies would be very problematic. It would be a severe drain on U.S. resources if Iran tried to seize the Straits of Hormuz. Saudi Arabia also needs to be reminded that it is relatively weak in the region and depends primarily on U.S. deterrence to maintain its independence. If one would recall the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein's Iraq in 1990, the U.S. was the pivotal state that restored the territorial status quo ante. Now, there are, of course, severe issues with Iran, which is that it's not compatible with the liberal values of Western countries. But it is a major regional power, and it has many of the same issues that Saudi Arabia does. It has a much stronger non-oil-based economy. 
And currently, its economy is about 25% that of Russia, which is significant. So there is still time for the West to improve relations with Iran, and sometimes values have to be sacrificed in order to follow strategies based on power that are a lot more important. If Iran sides with China and Iran closes the Straits of Hormuz after the U.S. Navy has blocked oil from reaching China, it would take a significant part of the U.S. Marine Corps and aircraft carrier fleet to redeploy to the region and defeat Iran. In fact, the U.S., even in the 1990s, had inadequate resources to occupy all of Iran. Iran was undefeatable, unlike Iraq or Afghanistan, which are much smaller. So it would be worthwhile for the West to ensure this does not happen by improving relations and conceding some of Iran's demands in terms of its sphere of influence, which are both reasonable and historically based. Now the same issue that China has in the Middle East of having a difficulty navigating between the Saudi and the Iranians in their common rival, the issue with the West is in their alliance with India, a large democracy and a pivotal counterbalance to China and South Asia, is that the domestic politics of the BJP party, which is led by Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi, the cabinet members occasionally make anti-Muslim comments, which aggravate the Muslim countries of the Near East that are Western allies and uh, would more likely support the U.S. rather than China. So the Middle East is a complicated place and it's difficult to gather the coalition because the wider community of democracies do have some anti-Islamic sentiments, some of them historical. Here you can see the 1990s seizure and destruction of the Ayodhya Mosque in India, which is still a strong source of animosity between India and the Muslim countries of the Middle East. Africa. China's early Cold War influence in Africa was revolutionary in providing military arms to various insurgent groups as well as development aid for socialist-leaning states like Tanzania, Somalia, and Uganda. China was also opposed to the apartheid government in South Africa. The growth of China's economy drove a demand for mineral and energy resources manifested by Chinese investments in mines and infrastructure in Africa for extraction, coupled with developments of roads, railways, and docks. China has consequently penetrated almost every market in Africa with its exports. Currently, there are estimates of 1 million Chinese workers in Africa and perhaps as many as 50,000 African workers in Guangdong province, China. China has been particularly helpful in the provision of official development assistance targeted at public health and has been forgiving debts in a number of instances in its Bricks and Road initiative. China has also financed Africa's new African Union headquarters. 30% of China's imported oil comes from Africa. These include Angola and Nigeria, as well as significant mineral trade with South Africa. In 2020, China's trade was already more than double the US trade with Africa or the French trade with Africa or the Indian trade with Africa. So very significant, even if China's trade is less than the totals of the European Union. China's made significant inroads in the Brick and Road Initiative in investing in infrastructure and opening up primary resource extraction companies that then export back to China. You can see that at one point the U.S. traded a lot more with Africa, but because the U.S. diversified its source of energy, particularly oil, that trade has dropped significantly.
less than 1.3% of total U.S. trade is with Africa. Africa simply doesn't matter in the larger scheme of U.S. trade, and that percentage has dropped from 2% uh, over 10 years ago. This is total investment in Africa. This is obviously driven by new projects and industrialization. So you can see the very rapid increase in Chinese African trade from 1978 to 2000 and then the huge leap until 2009 and then the doubling of that trade until 2020. Looking at the central bottom map you can see that China is the top country for imports into African countries in the majority, except in Southern Africa, where trade is with South Africa, and several countries like Gabon that continue trade with France. These are the different exports by countries. So China is primarily a primary product exporter, uh, including uh, minerals and food to Western and to the Chinese market. This is the relative investment from the Belt and Road investment map in 2020. And you can see that China has invested uh, in, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, at the third ranked after its investments in East Asia and West Asia. This is from the Economist Intelligence Unit and shows in 2020 the location of 22 Chinese built industrial parks or free trade zones. So it's intended to become either a depots or entrepots for passing trade or the setting up of manufacturing in Africa. So these are the areas where we would expect uh, manufacturing and industrialization to be concentrated in the different African countries. Again, you can see here the engagement of the Bricks and Road Initiative. Uh, by uh, China and the amount of construction. Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa absorbed the largest proportion of construction, one-third, at 27% uh, percent, between one-quarter and one-third, and 15% of the investment. So less investment than either West Asia or East Asia, but the most in terms of construction. And you can see that the uh, the focus of uh, China is on energy, metals, and transport, which is a large block. So China is essentially investing in the resources that it needs for its economy. So it's done. It's being done strategically. China is also engaged in a significant land grab, some of which you can see in Madagascar and uh, Sudan, and it can be compared with the purchase of arable land in other countries for export of food uh, back to China. Now Zimbabwe, President Robert Mugabe supported its strong ally of China sending military officers to China for training. While his revolutionary adversaries, ZAPU, led by Joshua Nakomo, were supported by the Soviet Union, his organization, ZANU, was backed by China. In 1979, the Chimorenga led to the defeat of the Rhodesian regime. In 2003, when Mugabe began land seizures to collapse the, the Zimbabwean economy, China provided economic assistance to sustain the country. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, under the new regime, continues to support China. Now, South Sudan. Although China imports more oil from southern Sudan, China has attempted to maintain balanced relations with both segments of the former Sudan. Angola. In 2006, Angola surpassed Saudi Arabia as China's top oil supplier for a brief period. In 2008, Angola became China's largest trading partner in Africa, and that lasted for a few years. Latin America. China's interest in Latin America has primarily been mineral and resources, and it totaled $130 billion in 2012 trade, and at that time was second only to the U.S. 75% of Latin America's exports to China 
were from Argentina and Chile uh, in the form of soya and copper. China depends heavily on soybean imports as feed for its animals. And you can see the sources here being Argentina, Brazil, and the US. Now China's ideological allies consist of Cuba, which has provided China two electronic listening posts since 1999 at Cal, and Venezuela, which has received military training aircraft from China and Bolivia with its revivalist indigenous movement. For a long time, Taiwan had sway with Latin American states over recognition, but in 2008, it abandoned checkbook diplomacy in the face of China's overwhelming economic influence. Here you can see the trade between various Latin American countries and the US. And China is a significant partner for many countries in Latin America. Here you can see China's economic footprint, both exports and imports over the years. And so it achieved a very high level in 2012, 2014, and largely has been maintaining that level. South America, again, it's a primary product supplier. Uh, you've got minerals as well as foodstuffs. So this is the value of total trade in 2020 by partner. Brazil trades twice as much with China as it does the US. Chile trades twice as much with China as the US as well because of copper. Uh, trade is closer between the US and China in Peru. Colombia trades more with the US. Uruguay, Venezuela, and Argentina, Peru all trade more with China. Now this is a question, will China become Latin America's largest trading partner? You can see in the graph here, the year in which the Latin American countries began trading more with China than the US. So you can see Brazil became an established trading partner with China in 2010, and that situation's not yet been reversed. And here you can see Latin America's main trading partners. You can see the proportional reduction of the US from about 50% down to 27%. And you can see China's gradual rise while the European Union and the UK and other Latin American countries largely remain static. So China's come to eclipse the US in trade in the region. Now, this here includes Mexico, which trades on a much higher volume with the US because it's linked quite closely to US industry. So Mexico is uh, an outlier here. And if it was excluded, then China would be Latin America's biggest trading partner. And this is impacts on political influence. Now, what's interesting, as was raised earlier in the lecture, is that in the democratic countries of Latin America, regardless of their strategic economic interest, there is support for the US rather than authoritarian China and Russia. So the Pacific Islands. The Pacific Islands stretch from South Central Pacific to the Southwest Pacific and are mostly independent islands falling under a number of sovereign states or predominantly US, French, British, or Japanese possessions. The Pacific Islands are sparsely populated and generally burdened with underdeveloped economies, but the islands provide strategic stepping stones, harbors, and airfields for domination of the Pacific Ocean, as they did under the Japanese and the U.S. during the Second World War, which you can see depicted here on the map. China has been pursuing favorable relations with the Pacific Island states. In 1997, China built a satellite tracking station on the Tarawa Atoll of Kiribati, which could be used to monitor U.S. missile tests. Under financial pressure, Kiribati switched its recognition to Taiwan and ejected the Chinese facility in 2004. China has provided military assistance to Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, Tonga, and especially Fiji, where a politically active Chinese minority could help give China a presence. There are occasional riots against Chinese merchants, as there were in the Solomon Islands and Tonga in 2006, although the total number of Chinese enterprises are estimated at 3,000, with a valuation of around $1 billion. Acquisition of some Pacific Islands would fall into China's goal of securing the second island chain. Now, China did sign a 2022 agreement with the Solomon Islands, 
which was primarily economic, but it had a provision in there that would allow the Chinese to deploy security forces to protect the Solomon Islands government. Now, following the Kiribati incident, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and U.S. have taken a more active interest in conducting naval patrols uh, to assert their presence. And in 2022, the U.S. initiated various initiatives with Japan and Australia to have representation for the interests of the island nations of the Pacific so that they would ally with the Western democracies. So here you can see a list of some of these islands with their uh, populations and their per capita. These islands are under significant duress due to climate change, which is reducing the shorelines of these islands. You can see these sort of splotches, which indicate the exclusive economic zones and the sovereign waters of these island nations. And you can see in part, in the center of the map, in purple, the Solomon Islands with its capital of Honiara, and how the loss of this would, to China, would lead to a major threat to shipping uh, in the area. I wrote an article in the Canadian uh, Naval Review, which received some uh, attention, and it regarded the threat that China posed to Western shipping interests particularly since the Solomon Islands are so strategic. The Solomon Islands were fought over during the Second World War by the Japanese and the uh, U.S. Marines, and 52 Japanese and American capital ships, uh, including uh, battleships, cruisers, and aircraft carriers, were lost in four separate aircraft carrier campaigns and an island hopping campaign that lasted a year. It was hotly contested area. The Japanese are trying to secure the islands because it would give them control over the airspace north of Australia and to the east of Australia. The Solomon Islands leadership uh, does not seem to think that the Western concern is a serious one. So I wrote a second piece detailing what the West could do to intervene into the Solomon Islands to reverse a possible Chinese takeover. In October of 1990, the European Union normalized its ties with China a year after the June 4th incident of the Tiananmen Square massacre. In 1989. But the European Union has maintained in place an embargo against military exports to China that China has been trying to have repealed ever since. For the European Union, politically, market access was less of a priority than human rights. China's trade to the European Union is substantial, although the trade deficit is substantially less than that of the U.S. Turkey has had some domestic interest in providing assistance to the Uyghurs who are widely viewed as being oppressed by Chinese occupation in Xinjiang province. China subtly threatened to retaliate by providing assistance to the Kurds fighting for autonomy against Ankara through Iraq. Uh, 